Hi, everyone. Welcome to Anoki Uncensored, our weekly show about breaking down barriers and building up communities that are inclusive, representative, and collaborative. I'm your host, Raj Gurn, the founder of the umbrella brand, Anoki Life, and I'm super excited to bring you today's show and guest, an artist I have long admired for his innovative and eclectic creativity. Described by Billboard magazine as a visionary composer and producer, Kash Kale is a pioneer in the world of global fusion. He moves between his many roles as tabla player, DJ and remix artist, multi-instrumentalist and film composer. Former US President Barack Obama has said about Kash that he mixes eclectic beats with sounds of his heritage to make a sound that is distinctly his own and I couldn't agree more. Please welcome to the show, the incomparable Kash Kale. Thank you so Thanks much for, for coming me. on. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, Kash. This is a fan moment for me here, having followed your journey over the past two decades, watching your music take unexpected twists and turns that mirror the twists and turns that life's journey takes us on. So mm. thank you so much for your incredible contribution to the world music scene. And I can't wait to jump right in. Are you ready? Sure. Brilliant. So folks, for those of you who don't know how truly respected Kosh is, you may want to look at some of his artists um, that he's collaborated with, people like Sting, U2, Alicia Keys, and the late, great Ravi Shankar himself. Today, I have the pleasure of chatting with Kosh about his latest album entitled Touch, which is his sixth album to date. Kosh, before we get into our discussion about the album, I'd like to ask you about your collaboration work. I know that you're very, very specific about the stories that you tell. Um, and I know that has a lot to do also with the types of artists you like to work with. Can you share how you choose um, the people that you want to collaborate with? Um, well, I mean, when, when I make my own music, uh, uh, I, I tend to I tend to approach my tracks uh, kind of as stories. Uh, so, so when I'm looking for, for collaborators, oftentimes they're characters within that story that I'm trying to tell. Um, but I'm, I'm mo more intrigued by people who I think like me are kind of adventurers. Um, a lot of the people that I oftentimes collaborate with more, you know, uh, I mean, people that I tour with, people that I record with more often uh, tend to be people that are a little bit more risk takers. Um, tend not to necessarily seek out collaborators who are fixed in a particular uh, kind of strict genre or style. Does that have something to do with the way that you compose, Kosh? Uh, you know, that some of it, you know, is about, you know, being um, mindful and intentful with, you mm -hmm. know, the artistry, and but part of it is kind of the flow and where that takes you with while you're collaborating with the artists. Like give us a bit of, you know, thoughts behind how your process works when you are collaborating and, you know, co-composing, I guess, um, on a certain degree with, with other artists and musicians. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, what I like to do is I like, like I said, I like to kind of take the statements that we make as musicians and turn them into characters within uh, either a story or a landscape. Um, so when I'm working with, with musicians who are coming from a very particular uh, place, say I'm working with a classical singer who's uh, singing a bandish or a classical or a bhajan or, or and, and it's something that in, it, in and of itself is a, is a classical um, presentation. Then what I try and do is I try and find a, a completely different world for that to exist in, to uh, kind of reinvent its meaning, to reinvent uh, sometimes it's mood um, and to take it out of context, uh, not just the now, not just the Indian classical, that's just the example, but all the things that I do in music, I, I really, what I try and do is really try and find a, uh, uh, an alternate universe for something that's familiar. So there's always something that's nostalgic or familiar in the music that I'm making, but then at the same time, I try and the setting is usually something foreign or something else, something disparate, you know. I mean, my, the, my first project that I had uh, put together before, before my first album with Six Degrees was called Classical Science Fiction from India. So it's, it's definitely a lot of 
science fiction in, in the uh, way that I approach uh, making music. That's wonderful, Kosh. It's so futuristic um, and, and very indicative of creatives in general. They tend to kind of look outside of the box that you know, the world has created to maybe look at an alternative you know, way of looking at life and experiencing it. So let's talk a little bit about Touch. Folks, mm. Touch is Kosh's sixth album and was produced during the lockdown last year, both in Brooklyn and Goa, and encompasses five songs which are very different from each other, which I'd like to now break down with a lot of help from Kosh himself. So Kosh, I want to ask you first, to create yeah. su some context around the album, I want to start by asking you how you personally were affected by the lockdown that ultimately inspired you to compose this album. Can you share a bit about that? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the, when the lockdown began, I was traveling in between India and, and the States. And I was actually supposed to come to the States for about three weeks, um, following a bunch of shows that I had up, out in LA, Chicago, and New York, um, which all one by one got canceled upon arriving. And, and I was grounded for six months in New York. Uh, I mean, the silver lining of that was I got to spend some time with my daughter before she went off to college. Um, but I didn't come back to India. I had a lot of shows canceled. I was grounded, I would, like, like, like everyone was. Um, and so I had to kind of start to figure out a new way of just expressing what I was going through. You know, I mean, more than anything, touch the album. I mean, and these first five songs is only the first half. There's a whole other half. There's another five songs coming in July, uh, which will be touched too. Um, but all of this music was created as a response to what I was going through, uh, you know, kind of watching New York City um, really just kind of fall apart and, you know, fall to its knees. And at the same time, when the protests that were going on, the Black Lives Matter movement that was happening um, and just how scary things got um, New York at that time being the epicenter of, of the pandemic and then coming to Goa uh, finally in August and kind of experiencing a bit of a different side of the world with the, with the same problem. Um, but, you know, I mean, finding a, a completely different uh, um, aesthetic ins inspiration, you know, finally kind of, kind, of, kind of coming to go. I didn't know how long I was gonna be here. I, usually d during the year, I'd go back and forth nine, 10 times between New York and Bombay and Goa. And this time I came here and I haven't left for eight months. Wow. So. Yeah, so like not going anywhere. And so basically spending six months in Brooklyn and six months in, in Goa is really how this album came to came to pass. And why most of it is actually me sitting in the studio by myself, because that was, you know, what this year was mainly about. It was about, mm -hmm. you know, somewhat reaching out to people like this on Zoom calls and things like that, but otherwise being very isolated and, you know, touch being something that we all need and we all were craving you know, this year being so isolated from each other. Absolutely. Before we get into each of the tracks, which I really want to um, dive into, just because they're all extremely different from each other. And I know that they're mm -hmm. very intentional. Um, I want to ask you this. What's the overarching message of the album that you hope everyone will get from listening to it? I mean, each song well, has its own, right? But if you were to kind yeah. of encapsulate it, what would that be? Well, I think that we went through uh, a collective experience and I, th I would hope that some people would reflect that collective, collective experience through these tracks, you know, and like I said, these are, this is only the first half of the, of the whole album. Um, and it really goes on a whole roller coaster of, I mean, because we almost started experiencing days in like a, a schizophrenic kind of, you know, uh, emotional roller coaster kind of way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you, you experience serenity and you experience hope and then all of a sudden despair and fear and anxiety and, you know, and, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, trying to overcome challenges and then all of a sudden you're, over, you're overwhelmed by challenges. So those, that diversity is what made me want to kind of configure the record this way where it really was jumping from, you know, a full on a dance track where you want to just kind of you know, stand in front of a DJ and lose yourself and dance and then a track that's really introspective and then something that completely disarms you and, 
makes you think about, you know, the people that you're missing, um, you know, and things like that. So that's kind of what I feel like a lot of us, you know, go through in one day. So, mm-hmm. you know, so I've, the album, as opposed to it being a bunch of dance tracks or a bunch of tracks that are similar to each other, I wanted to kind of express the whole spectrum, you know, kind of like a diary of what the whole lockdown was like, at least for me. You know, I really did get that, um, you know, the year where everything was in extremes on so many levels um, and, you know, extreme on the negative side. Obviously, we all have seen that we've experienced it, but also extremes on a very positive side, because, you know, all of a sudden here we were being reminded of, you know, what the true importance and essence of humanity is, is, you know, the collective consciousness, the, you know, the togetherness and, you know, being on this mission together in life. And I feel that that really has gotten lost over the, at least my entire lifetime. And I'm 51. This is Mm. the first time I've ever experienced this kind of being projected into this place where I'm questioning so many things about my life and about the world and, yes. you know, my contribution to it and its contribution to my life. And I feel yeah. that your album really did do that for me when I, you know, close my eyes and listen to it. Um, there's so many elements of it that really brought those feelings out for me. It really amplified it. So I really want to kind of dive into it, Amkash, with you. want to kind of mm-hmm. get your mind behind some of these tracks. And I want to encourage people to go and just grab a copy of this album just because it truly is indicative of an experience shared for all of us this past year so my 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 next question for you is this i'm really curious about the album cover the Mm -hmm. you know the the theme of orange being by you know the water there having a man dressed in an orange suit the the kind of orange fog partially covering him what's the symbolism there well, it's, uh, I think it's just, uh, it's supposed to be a moment, uh, you know, and touch being something that, you know, what can happen in a moment of touch, you can get a sound out of a drum, or you can get, you know, something like that can happen, you know, just by, just by a touch that, you know, all of a sudden, he's almost as if he's becoming ash, or he's, mm. you know, disintegrating or changing form, you know, so that, that, that was kind of the original. I mean, I love the, uh, the, the image the image was shot by Anya Mattis, uh, who happens to be the mother of my of my twenty year old daughter. Uh, so oh, she's that's wonderful. I'm a huge fan of her work. Uh, so you know we were we were we, I was I showed her the you know the album and then she was she basically showed me some some of the work that she had just been working on and that was the one I chose for the. For well, you know, I, you're going to laugh when I tell you what I thought the symbolism was. I have to share it with you just because I want to mm-hmm. give you a laugh. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know how COVID is a flu and the, um, you know, and, and, you know, the best way to combat flu is to just increase the defense mechanism, you know, overarchingly in your body and vitamin C, yeah, yeah, yeah. vitamin C is supposed to be kind of like the golden, um, you know, way of doing that. So I thought like the whole orange was kind of like vitamin C and healing and and i thought it was all, all, well, all there, about there, that. Definitely was, there definitely was an element of, of healing in that i mean i don't know if it was necessarily vitamin c but <laughs> <laughs> well i have to share that with you because that's just kind of what came to me but i love your version a lot better than mine because mine's a little comical but it, it does kind of still fit within the theme of you know why you decided to do this album and and why you know why at this time it's so important for us to have these conversations so let's talk a little bit about the title track touch you've mm-hmm. already touched upon it no pun intended um mm-hmm. very appropriate for the anguish we have all gone through during the lockdown not being able to physically touch our loved ones and you know yeah. and taking it for granted We've, we've taken, you know, our ability to communicate and converse and touch and hug and love each other without really yeah. thinking about it, right? And, you know, sure. you, he, you just finished talking about the fact that this was something that, you know, was something that we've all grappled with. It's something you grappled with, you know, first being isolated for six months of the year in New York. And now you've been pretty much that long, if not longer, in Goa. So it's, it's like not being able to have the fluidity 
that you're used to having in your life, being stuck either in one place or another, this does cause, um, you know, a lot of anxiety for a lot of us. And it's a universal feeling that we've all been sharing. Now, yeah. other than that, and the fact that I flipping loved that kind of New York lounge vibe that the song, you know, gave me, that's the feeling I have because I'm one of those people that before the lockdown was always in New York every like six to eight weeks. I love mm -hmm. the kind of vibe and energy around it. And I felt that in this song. It was uh, really a response to being in New York. Mm -hmm. It was very much a New York uh, um, kind of statement. Uh, at that time, it was, you know, when, when things like that happen in New York City, there is a sound that comes out of that. And, mm -hmm. you know, for me, that was kind of a fist in the air, um, kind of a uh, moment where, where I felt like, you know, at, at some point we'll dance, at some point we'll all dance together and we'll all put our fist in the air and, you know, we've been through this and we got through it and we got to the end and now we're dancing. So that was kind of, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if I was going to end the album with Touch mm -hmm. or, or start it, but I felt like uh, it made more sense to just kind of come out with that, that kind of uh, attitude towards what's happening you know, as opposed to coming in, you know, because the rest of the record goes in all different directions emotionally, yeah. you know, so I wanted to start with a bit of a celebration, high-fiving everybody on our way in, you know. And you totally get that vibe with that song. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the second track on the album. It's called Refugee and it's centered around yeah. the Black Lives Matter protest that went into overdrive last year and rightfully yeah. so. Can you shed light on the composition here? Because like most of your tracks, it beautifully builds, but there's something very emotional about the way that you open the track. Can you, mm. can you shed light on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, I was, the track kind of came from, you know, when I was talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, it was, it was what was happening at that time, what was happening outside of, uh, all over the world, what was happening in New York City and what was happening for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I was, you know, I had six, seven attempts of trying to fly out uh, to come back to go up, um, which were all canceled one by one. Um, and and then just the hoops that at the, I think at that time that, that we all had to go through just to simply travel. Mm -hmm. um, it was really scary and it was really, and, and so all of that kind of combined all that chaos was what really went into that track. And it was, you know, within that chaos, I was melodically searching for a, a, a resolve. So that's kind of what, you know, and refugee just was just a feeling, mm -hmm. um, the feeling of, of being, uh, you know, all of a sudden everything, the floor under you, you know, kind of being taken out and not knowing where you're gonna land. Mm -hmm. I really did get a sense of that. The feeling that I got from the track also was, you know, you 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 slowly built into the song. And that that for me was a moment to say, we have to, you know, have a moment of silence to kind of sit with what this actually means, what happened here with the Black Lives mm. Matter, um, you know, movement. And then, you know, it really builds and it builds mm. really fabulously. And, and, and my sense of that, because I, I, I'm, I'm very symbolic. Everything I look at, I look for symbolism. I look for a meaning mm. in it. And so the other, the, the two other, the two other thirds of the song for me were kind of like, you know, people in protest, people walking, people, you know, yeah. getting together around the world. And I just felt the energy of that from mm -hmm. that part of the song. So I just wanted to share yeah. that with you. That That's what I got out of out of when I yeah, I mean to that that, song. that that is how the kind of the story you know the first thing you feel is a sense of uh, almost tragedy and loss, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it picks up because there is a movement, you know, and then that movement starts to pick up pace, you know, and and then it comes to a, a, a heightened when when both those sections come together, you know, and kind of exist at the same moment. Mm. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad I got that one right, at least, even though I didn't get the album cover right. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you about track three. I have to say this is it's hard to choose a favorite, but this is probably in the top three 
for mm. me. Track three is called Lovers, mm. and it features the fabulous Malini Awasti. The lament mm. of the pandemic-induced estrangement from our loved ones is such a haunting component of this track for me. Something so many of us are still going through, especially here in Canada, Kosh, where the lockdown is still going on. I mean, yeah. the rest of the world is opening and we are still, we're still, you know, suffering from this, you know, this separation that I feel is so much of the angst of this song. Can you share a little bit about this song for everyone? Yeah, I, I mean, when I start, first started kind of uh, uh, working on this piece of music, I, it was absolutely about uh, that, that feeling of longing and that feeling of absence and that separation that I was feeling from so many people, you know, and so many loved ones. Um, and uh, it, it just so happened that a few years uh, earlier, I was in the studio with Malini Avasti when we were working on a completely different piece of music. But while we were sound checking her microphone, she just sang some of these pieces, um, the Salaria lines. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I just had that sitting in a folder somewhere and I hadn't opened it for three years. And I just, while I was working on this piece, I remembered that what she had sang. So I pulled it out and then just started taking parts of it and then just started composing around it. And uh, yeah, so that, that was, you know, it didn't really go any farther than that in terms of what the song was about. You know, it was really, I, I knew while I was making it that millions and millions of people around the world are feeling this feeling right now. Mm -hmm. So that was the inspiration to make that, that piece I, of music. I love that. Well, we're getting close to um, the end of the five um, songs for part one of um, the Touch album. Um, the second to last track on the album is called Fist of Fury and probably my favorite track because mm -hmm. it's signature mm -hmm. Kosh and just mm -hmm. makes me feel energized and wanting an all night dance party, which we can't have right now. And probably if we were to have right now at my age, I'll probably, you know, have an aneurysm or something, but it gives you that feeling. <laughs> it gives you that feeling to just kind of want to have an all night party. Um, yeah. I want you to know that I've been pelotoning to that song. It just lifts me up. <laughs> now, this is a continuation of the Liquid Tabla series that you started two decades ago. What would you like people to know about this track other than it makes you want to get up and dance hard? Well, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, for me, and it, it is totally on a personal level, I've always found something analogous between the, these kind of tracks that I do, the, mm -hmm. the tabla driven electronic tracks, which are usually more dance oriented, uh, to uh, my uh, um, long time affinity to Bruce Lee. So I've always made, you know, so tracks like Supernova and Be Like Water, um, you know, and of course, so Fist of Fury is, is the title of a Bruce Lee film as well. Yes. Um, so there is definitely a little bit of my, you know, childhood, you know, uh, you know, fascination with Bruce Lee and kind of an ode to him, you know, in these kind of tracks. Uh, but more than anything, you know, almost on a weekly basis, I get messages from people who want to hear more of these kind of tabla tracks. Yes. You know, so, and I, I, I think I took a bit of a break in making something like that. So Fist, Fist of Fury was kind of a long time coming since I had put out uh, the Up album where, you know, I think Be, Be Like Water was the last track I put out that was of this kind of series of, of, of tracks. Absolutely. Well, it's signature Kosh. Like nobody, nobody does that better than you, Kosh. It's, it's, this is mm -hmm. what we know you for, right? So, so I, and, and I guess that's why it's my favorite song on the um, entire album. And that's hard because all the songs are very, very um, specific in the feelings mm -hmm. that they, that they evoke um, yeah. in people and definitely what, how they invoked in me. So let's talk a little bit about the final track on the album. Mm -hmm. It's called Sunset Sketch. And there's an yeah. interesting story around how this song came into being. Can you share that? Because it was a phone conversation you were having. That's what I read. Yeah, I was, I was on the phone with, with someone who I am uh, very close to. And uh, she was in, in Bombay uh, and watching the sunset and she's sending me photographs of that uh, of that sunset and I was you know in New York and the sun was just rising you know at that same time wow. so so it was uh you know it was uh, and, and I was sending photos as well 
So I just, right after that conversation, sat down and started working on that. And that kind of came out in one go, in one, you know, one afternoon where I, uh, you know, just kind of came up with that whole piece of music. And it was, you know, something that I had, another piece that I had worked with uh, Ajay Prasanna on, you know, probably about a year, a year back, I just pulled out and started writing around that. And it just felt like that sunset. Wow, I love it. What a great, what a great song to actually end the album on because it's kind of, you know, in a, and, and the, the message is beautiful because in, you know, in a part of a world, in a part of the world, you know, we are waking and in the other part of the world, we are going into slumber. It's very indicative yeah. of um, just, you know, the journey of humanity when someone's doing something something else is happening elsewhere it's it's it's, yeah. it's beautiful i love i love everything about all of the songs on here um kosh i'm excited about the second album too but yeah. what i want to ask you is um mm -hmm. is this album available right now and is it available wherever music is sold yes okay Absolutely. so, so people can go people. grab it they can grab it wherever music is sold. I mean, brilliant. I mean, mostly online, of course, but you know, of course. But yes, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, uh, Geo Seven. So, are there any final words you'd like to add about the album, Kosh, that maybe I haven't touched upon? No, I think we, you know, we dove in pretty deep uh, of the album. You know, like I said, what you know, we talked about the last track as if it's the last track, but it's actually just the end of the first uh, act, you know, so the, so touch two is definitely a, it's a similar, but very different journey than touch one. But, you know, eventually we are listening to the whole thing from beginning to end will make even more sense. Absolutely. And when can we hope for that one to be released? That's going to be coming out in mid July. Okay. Brilliant. So folks, you heard it right here. Um, Part two of Touch will be coming out in July. Part one is already available everywhere that music and, is sold online. And also in uh, late August, early September, I'll be releasing a full remix album of uh, Touch tracks by a list of fantastic artists, which I will not mention yet. Oh my God. Well, that one I'm definitely picking up, Kosh. That sounds so <laughs> exciting. Folks, this is an album that represents the human experience that bonded us together this past year. As we went through one of the worst years of our life on one side, but also one of the best on the other because we were reconnected to our humanity and to nature and to, you know, thinking about who we are and who we wanna be and what we wanna identify with and what's important to us. We are reminded of this message of universality and that none of us exists without the other, be it people, our health, or the environment. So let's never forget this past year and commemorate it by purchasing a copy of Kashi's spectacular album, Touch. It's already available. Part two, as you heard, is coming out mid-July. And then the remix of both of them, with a lot of interesting artists that Kosh is going to be letting us know about when the time is right, will be coming out in August. All of this encapsulates the beautifully orchestrated composition of the human awakening, something that I feel Kosh has been doing a very long time. And um, before I think most people were really thinking about music from that perspective. Thank you so much, Kosh, for coming on my show and sharing invaluable insights about why you do what you do and why you are who you are. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so, so much for having me. It was oh a my pleasure. God. And I cannot wait till the next time we get to chat. Really, I mean let's, that. Let's chat soon because uh, there's some more stuff to chat about. When should we do the next? I cannot wait.